I'm Mark Mitchell with Marks and Splashes Online Learning. I'm in Austin, Texas, and we've got Cindy Wider, who is in Yorkshire, England, with us. It's Hi. Uh, Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. Hey, Cindy. It's late afternoon in uh, Yorkshire, where Cindy is, and we're uh, thrilled to have her with us again. Today is her, uh, her final lesson for us, and she's going to talk about um, the four comparison skills in drawing observational and comparison skills that most of us have already and if you can isolate and understand them a little bit and practice a little bit the progress is very very fast and so uh, Cindy I'm going to uh, let you s sort of take it from there we're going to sh we're going to see a PDF that she's prepared for us kindly if you want your own copy of the PDF lesson uh, to the right of the video player is a box a d details box and it's the first link and that will sign that will uh, it's a sign up link for the drawpj.com newsletter which is uh, very valuable and uh, not obnoxious and uh, and when you when you sign up for that we will send uh, the PDF to you in an email right away and you can and you can download the uh, Cindy's lesson PDF from that email okay so uh, Cindy, I'm going to put you up. Did you want to ask everybody if they can hear us first, or are you okay? With yeah, that? let's 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 do check that. Let me let me run over to the event page. I remember last time everybody was saying I can't hear you. Can't hear, can't see. Yeah, so let me. Uh, if you can hear us okay, would you please type a Y in the comment box uh, underneath the player, and uh, that's actually going to be where you uh, can ask Cindy questions later. If the screen freezes up on you, uh, just hit the refresh button on the player. I'm going to watch for yeses here for a second, Cindy. Yeah, no problem, Mark. Yeah, it's important that everybody can hear us, otherwise we have to repeat it all again. I Yes. I hate it when that happens. So if you can if you can hear and see us okay, type a Y in the comment box. Maybe nobody can hear us yet. I think they can. I think there's just a little bit of a lag. But let's we'll we'll make sure of that. Okay, I'm the yeses are coming in, Cindy. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I'm gonna uh, leave you up, Cindy, and uh, you tell me when you're ready for me to go share your PDF and. Uh, start turning pages for you, okay? Oh, fabulous. Oh, well, I thought I'd just start out, first of all, saying thank you to everybody who's made the time to come along today. It's always lovely to know that I'm talking to some people out there, not just to a camera. Um, it's a very exciting topic that we're talking about today, the role the brain has in helping us to be able to draw. And I'm very passionate about this subject because the knowledge that I have is based deeply on experience that I've had myself with my own brain, with things that happened to me, and Mark would know my story, and any of you who have read Painting Your Pajamas, the book that I wrote, that um, really, I guess really summarises the whole reason why I teach art in the first place. It's because uh, many years ago um, I had an, an illness and I turned to art and turned to drawing as a form of therapy and as a result of that I discovered all these things about the brain and how the brain is involved in such a huge way with how we draw and it was a really good thing that happened to me. I, I had an illness, I had um, chronic fatigue syndrome and I learnt to, um, I had because I had lost all of my cognitive abilities I um, turned to drawing as a form of solace, you know, respite, and I really quickly found myself being able to draw realistically like never before, and I had given up drawing at the age of 14, believing that I wasn't talented enough. So to be able to suddenly find myself drawing realistically just out of the blue, it, it was a big shock mark. I just, mm. I, I was so excited but also really confused because I know that I'd given up you know, drawing as a child and all of a sudden this drawing was coming out of me and this realistic painting was coming out of me. So, um, wow. yeah, that's fascinating. And, and, yeah, really interesting. And so 
I was so excited about that that I just wanted to tell the whole world. I just wanted to tell everyone. And I did try to do that, Mark. I was saying to people, <laughs> you know, you can learn to draw too. I've just learned it. I've just discovered how to do it. And, you know, people, don't you have to be born talented to be able to draw? And I think I've spent the last 23 years, Mark, trying to explain to people um, and tell people how that is a complete myth. And um, we're, we're going to debunk that myth today once and for all. That is my goal with all of you, um, to really explain it so that you fully understand where drawing is, where it comes from, what it is. And it's an incredible journey. And I hope you stick it out with me because I really am so grateful to Mark for giving me the opportunity to speak about this because I've been wanting to sort of talk about it as an entire subject for quite a while now. So Great. today that's what it's going to be all about. Yeah, it's going to be all about the role that the brain plays in drawing. And it's not complicated. It's very easy. And there's only four things that we're going to be talking about. One of the main things about drawing is that so many people seem to get stuck in the same places. And I find that really amazing. You know, I can just look at a person's artwork on the internet and I can immediately detect the area that needs yeah. um, fixing or adjusting in the work. And it, it all it's always put down to one of the four major skills that we're talking about today. So we've got the beginning of the booklet here and I've just put together a little collage of some amazing past students work. All of these people that I have the images have given me permission to use them. And what you see there is you'll see their before picture and then their after picture in that collage. So a little before up in say the top left side of the screen you'll see a, a very childlike drawing and then you'll see the more um, realistic drawing. You know you can see them alongside each other. I don't know if you understand that Mark but can you still oh, get yeah. the impression that you've got a before work and an after work there. They're not photographs, they are the after drawings of students' works. Now that is just 64 hours after um, studying with me. And this is the exciting thing about our course is the revolutionary progress that people make is beyond you could imagine. And that's really exciting to me. When I say 64 hours later, these people have been studying usually on average two to four hours a week. And they've gone methodically and um, systematically through the course. They've actually studied the course and they've submitted their work to the instructor, either to myself as their instructor or to one of my ladies that I've trained. And the whole idea is that if you work through the course notes, specifically, methodically, it's all designed to provide you with everything that you need to, to go from an absolute beginner into professional. Now, it's important to note, too, that most people begin drawing as an adult at a childlike level. So wherever you left off as a 12-year-old child, that's generally where you're going to be picking up and beginning. So don't be worried about that. Because one of the first things I ask for in the course is a pre-instruction drawing. And it, sometimes, sometimes I sort of wait mark for about a week or two for people to submit their drawing. <laughs> um, but don't be afraid of that because it's just a record of how you can draw when you first begin. So there you go. That's just a little okay. collage that I put together. You can go on to the next page. So yeah, most people study the course for about two to four hours a week. It's not a real lot of your time. And it's a good progress to make if you travel at about two to four hours a week. So let's begin talking about these four skills. Um, first of all, I've, I've just been going on saying about how anybody can learn to draw, just about anybody. Um, when we say anybody, Mark, it's a very difficult and delicate subject to approach because some people just are not born that way. They may have autism or they may have a disability of some sort. I can't really explain. Um, you know, these are whole skills that I'm talking about. So when I say most people, I'm saying most ordinary healthy people. Do, does that sort of explain it correctly? Yeah. Politically yeah. correct, is that correct? You know, most people that are born with um, good health and and have all of their systems, all their cognitive abilities and that, are able to learn how to draw. And the, yeah. the single sort of deciding factor is whether or not you have the passion to do it. So do you have the passion to learn to draw? Do you have the desire? And do you have the self-belief? Now, I because know if you do, if you do have those, Cindy, you'll you'll be willing to put in the little bit of time. Yeah. More than a little bit of time it takes. Well, it takes courage too to learn yeah. to draw, yeah. and um, I'm talking about learning to draw so well that you are then free to draw from your imagination. 
And yes, the course the course is steeped in um, theory and methods and technique that are handed down from the great masters of art, but it's also combined with a lot of modern knowledge about the brain and about the role the brain um, plays in helping us learn to draw. So we can go back to the document, and what I'm saying is that nearly anybody can learn to draw. So um, if you believe that you have missed the boat or you, you just weren't I said you can just put that little myth aside now as we move on into this section. Um, now, the course that I've designed is completely unique. It is based on using four natural abilities that we are all born with. As I said, most of us, most of us are born with, most um, healthy person is born with. Now, let's look at these four natural abilities and how they relate to your drawing experience. So the first natural ability is your ability to be able to compare horizontal and vertical. This is a very interesting skill and you're using this skill when you're straightening a painting on a wall or straightening <laughs> furniture. I don't know if you do that, Mark, but you sort of walk around your home and just tap the bottom of the painting to straighten it. Do, do you get that feeling? <laughs> do you tend to do that? Uh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah. It, well, anyway, a lot of people do that. We just we have this natural ability to be able to straighten things. And sure, we might be a bit rubbish at it. I know even after years and years of drawing, I still take several turns to get a painting straight, and especially if I haven't got my glasses on. So I'm not saying that you have to become suddenly absolutely fantastic at this skill. It's about being aware. I do know, however, when the painting is still crooked, so I keep adjusting it just finely, very finely and finely. So it's all about being aware of your ability to compare an angle or a curve to vertical or horizontal. So this very first skill is so important. So now that I've said that, that most of us have this ability to be able to compare horizontal and vertical or things to horizontal and vertical. I'm not saying though we have to go around talking to ourselves in angles and saying oh my goodness this is 45 degrees or this is 30 degrees or whatever. You just have to visually compare it in your mind and be able to say to yourself um, that this is on a slight angle now. I don't know if you can see me on the big screen, can you Mark? Can I, you I'm, see I'm seeing you on the big screen now, Cindy. Oh, yeah. When I'm talking about comparing angles, you need to become gradually um, aware of exactly what horizontal and vertical is in space and especially when you're drawing from life. When you're drawing from life you need to just imagine this vertical plumb line just dropping like if you have a rock tied to a piece of string and you drop it straight down to the ground you see this vertical line and then you see a horizontal line and then you can compare everything in your drawing to that. So you start thinking then in angles and every little angle compares to that vertical or horizontal. You can use your pencil in an outstretched arm like that, you know, with your elbow locked in and stretched out to capture the angle, but never, never tilt it forward like that or tilt it backward. You always turn your pencil either to the side like that, you know, to compare it to vertical and horizontal. You can capture that movement, then you can carry that down to your drawing surface. So you can keep that angle and you put it straight down to your drawing surface. That's if you're drawing from life. Now, in the course, that's it, Mark. Oh, there's a special way to do it too, by the way. You've got to stick your little pinky. Your little pinky has to go back behind the pencil. And your elbow should be locked in. So have a look at my hand. Can you see that? We can put you back up. Hang on a second. You see how I'm holding that? Yeah. See the pinky? Yeah. Now that's very important because if you don't have that, your pencil can tilt or tip. But if you've got your little pinky in there, it gives you the best chance of keeping it perpendicular to the ground. And the other thing to do is make sure that your elbow is locked into place and then you close one eye. Work out which eye is your strongest because it's either your left or your right side is your strongest eye. I know which one mine is because I've got a um, stigmatism in one eye. So. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's fighting and you close, close one eye. And then you can capture your angles. You can also capture sizes like that as well, but I'm not talking about sizes right now. We might do that again later for the sizes comparison. So the very first major comparison skill that you're naturally born with is your ability to be able to compare angles to a horizontal or vertical line. So I know that everybody could tell me that that is not straight. That is not yeah. horizontal. That's on an angle. And you can see the difference of angle. And then you can shoot to understand slight angles, just very slight. More and more angles that you understand, 
the quicker you're going to be able to draw in outline. So that's the first major skill. Let's okay. go to the next one, Mark. Great. I actually, while we're on the angle skill, we'll see the next page, sorry. So let's talk about that apple that yep. I drew last week. Um, I drew an apple very quickly for you all and sketched it. You probably can't see it that well. Oh, yeah, it comes clear when the screen stands still. Do you all remember, whoever turned up to my last um, tutorial, you would have seen me draw the apple, and I just sketched it really quickly in the beginning. Now, the first thing I did when I was drawing the apple, I used my horizontal and vertical comparison skills. I drew a center vertical line down through the middle, round about the middle of the apple, and then I drew a horizontal line. So after that, I used my pencil and I just laid it on the outside of the apple on angles and just captured all the major angles around the apple. And then when you scroll down a little bit, it's an absolute breeze to put the curves in. You just sketch in the curves then. So that's your first skill. And in the art course that I've designed, Unit 1 concentrates on that skill solely. We don't even go into shading. I'm not interested in shading. This is very important because the whole idea of my course, Mark, is that I make sure that we really get good at this ability to compare angles before we move on to thinking about light and shade. You know, if, you, um, if you're given a still life to just suddenly draw and you've never really drawn very much before, it's a massive subject. You've got to think of all four major comparison skills at once. So the whole idea of the course is that you just slow down and you think of just one comparison skill. Although we can never really separate the mark, we can't ever really separate these comparison skills when we're drawing. We do tend to need to rely on one or the other. So when drawing the apple, we will also rely on our comparison of sizes skill as well. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But the next skill, we'll get the little booklet up again. Sorry to make you go up and down right. with this PDF, but it is handy to have your images. Yeah, hang on just so we'll one second. That file again. And the next comparison school that we're looking at and talking about today is our ability to compare light and shade. Now, most of you will understand this skill. Um, it's your ability to be able to see, say, what time of day it is just by the light outside. We can tell if it's morning or night. It's a little bit trickier in England, Mark, than what it was in Australia. <laughs> Good point. I look outside and I say to Stuart, I bet it's about 2 o'clock. He goes, no, nah, it's a bit later. And I go, no, I know it's about 2 o'clock. And sure enough, he's right. <laughs> but in, in Australia, when it's, when it's a beautiful blue sky day, you can really get that feeling of what time it is of the day, whether it's morning, night. And we do have a very good ability to compare light and dark, but... This is one skill that our brain tends to look at objects and just think, well, that's black or white, dark or light. You've either got the light turned on or you've got it turned off. Now, our ability to be able to um, compare various levels of light and shade um, naturally is good, but it's not something that we always do. We don't need to, do we, Mark? We don't need to see things as half grey or half light in our everyday life. So the beauty of this skill, we can develop it. It is that we can develop it. And with some very, very valuable lessons and courses and knowledge that's been handed down to us from the great masters, things like value scales, and also understanding where the five major areas of light and dark are. You are able to fine tune your eye and to develop a much better ability to compare the various levels of light and dark. Now, if you scroll to the apples, let's have a look at these two apples now. On the left, if you're looking at your screen, that is the photograph of the apple mark. And then on the right, that is my colour pencil drawing that I did last week in grayscale. Oh, wow. Okay. Amazing. So, yeah, so, so you can see the pattern of light and dark, which is almost identical. Not quite, but almost identical. And now what we'll do with the next picture, we're going to analyse this light and dark theory, if you could just slide down to the next picture. Now, I've broken this up into the five major areas of light and dark so that you can see 
what I'm talking about here. Now, letter A there, that is what we call the full light area. That is where the light first hits the form. Now, if you're setting up a still life, it is much easier to have just one single light source. Of course, when you get more um, experienced, sure, try out a couple of different light sources, but most artists use a single light source to set up a still life. And remember that my, I'm just when in the course, I'm just teaching the very basics, but these basics can carry you for years um, and form a solid foundation that you can then expand upon later. Yeah. So this is this is based on one single light source. Now, with one single light source, we have the full light area where the light has hit the form, and then at letter B, you will see the shadow edge. Now this area is where the form gradually moves away from the light for the very first time. So it's sort of disappearing, almost completely disappeared from the light. Very good, thanks for that. So that's the, sh that's the, um, the shadow edge area. And it's very important to be aware of these five areas of light and shade. You don't have to remember their names, just be aware of them. And that shadow edge area is, um, if you go to let us, now let's go to letter D next. Letter just D, before, okay. Yeah, right. D, because just before you reach that shadow edge area, we have an area called the half tones. And it's a transition time between the full light area and until it reaches that point where the object just disappears from the light or the light disappears from the form. So that's all your shadow edge area at letter D there. And then if we go down to letter C, that's reflected light. And I love reflected light, Mark, because you know, it really can be the difference between your artwork looking realistic and not. Mm. And this one little picture that I'm describing to you is possibly one of the most valuable things that you could learn today. Because if you get this, um, this grayscale picture right, your color doesn't matter. It's not about the color. People will recognize these light and shade these light and dark tones right. much faster than what they will recognize color. So re right. the reflected light is the light that's bouncing off the surface. And don't make the mistake of making your reflected light area, at letter C there, don't make that as light as the full light area, which is letter A. So we don't want it to be really too, too bright in that letter C area, the reflected light. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will flatten the object in space. It's, reflecting from, it's reflecting from the, the in this the case, table? the table. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the surface. And when you introduce color, you can put the color in there of objects surrounding the apple. You right. know, so you can put you know, different apple, colors into color that reflected apple. light. Mm -hmm. But we're just talking about tone at the moment because this is the second major skill that you learn in drawing. Remember, there's only four. This is so exciting, Mark. Four skills that are going to liberate everyone after today. I find this so exciting. Yeah. Then we, look, <laughs> then we look at letter um, E, and this is the cast shadow. That's the shadow that the human mind knows the most down the bottom there, the cast shadow. That's that big shadow that a lot of us think is just black and that we see at the bottom of a tree when it's a sunny day. Um, so the big cast shadow, and it's not black. And in fact, you can put so much color into that shadow, um, some beautiful grays just by using your two complementary colors mixed together and even the complementary of the object itself. But again, we're not talking about that today. We're just talking about tone. That will usually be the darkest part of the entire drawing in most cases. And that area could also be right up in the top of the apple. If we go up there, we scroll up the apple a little bit, Mark. See up in there? There is down inside the apple there, see at the base, that was another very important place to put that very dark um, shadow area as well. But notice the shadow of the stalk, you know, the stem of the apple, and notice it just curving over the apple, the shadow on the apple itself, Mark, just back behind there, yeah, there. See how that shadow curves over the apple? That's really important because shadows do follow the shape of the form and it's also a lot lighter up there because it's in the light. Mm. So a, a cast shadow that's in the light will be lighter than a cast shadow that's in shadow, if that makes sense. Oh, it does, yeah. Now, you know what I'm really excited about this? If you get to really know these five areas of light and shade, 
you can draw things from imagination just by applying these things. You don't even have to see them in a photograph. And you know what, Mark? A lot of the times we can't even see those five areas in a photograph because a photo flattens the area and it flattens space because it's monocular vision. Mm. So often you can't see that. And I see a lot of people trying to just copy the photo and it's so flat and lifeless because they haven't applied dual knowledge. And in the course you'll learn, you need to apply dual knowledge. You need to apply the science of light and shadow with what you're seeing. Now, never just copy the, sh the photo itself. It will lie to you. <laughs> Wait it, Mark. Uh, Cindy, uh, it looks like I might have messed up again and not put the, uh, the screen up. I'm going to ask if you'll go over the... The, the light and shade thing once again. I'll have a sip of coffee while you do that. <laughs> yeah, and I, my apologies. Um, let's let's uh, let's do the screenshot. That's that's what I'm afraid of. Um, and thanks for Don't letting. Worry me... about it. So we're going to go back over that. Um, I the think five we should. Areas. Yeah, and and in the edit, I'll I'll cut out what we yeah I'll cut out the repeat of it oh this is fine for everybody watching you'll get double information double double Ooh, double exposure better. double reinforcement okay so yeah. let me make sure they're all seeing it Cindy hang on yeah, we'll wait. there no we go problem. there we go and I'm gonna okay, so let's look at this apple once again so yeah. when I was talking about the full light area you can see it really bright up there at letter A so I'm going to start from the beginning though if you don't all that, mind, I'll just say good. it again. Yeah, it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. It's, it's that okay, big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we're doing is we're looking at the apple that I've drawn in grayscale, and I'm using this as an example to demonstrate the five major areas of light and shadow, and these five major areas are so important in your drawing. They're very, very valuable. Um, once you understand where these five major areas of light and shadow are and then you apply them to your drawing, your drawings can come to life immediately. And this is really exciting. Not only do they come to life, you can also draw from imagination. So we'll look at the apple here and you can see the letter A. This is what we call the full light area. So the full light area is where the light first hits the form. And it's always good to have just one light source when you're sitting up a still life so that you don't confuse the lighting. Of course, when you get more experience, you can add different light sources if you, if you wish. But it's most common practice to just have one single light source lighting up the form. And at letter A, you can see the full light area. That's where the light first hits the form. And then we move down to letter B. Cindy, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second just to, for clarification? The light source, as I'm interpreting it, is a, a, on top, above, and it's a little bit on the front. Is that right? Kind of Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and you can see it there where it's really sparkling at that first letter A, the one that's written on your left there. See that one? Yeah, there. That's where it's hitting the object. But it is slightly above... The, the apple itself, just yeah. very slight. And you can you can see how it's casting the shadow of the stem, and yeah. that gives you a sense of where the light source is. Okay, thank you, Cindy. That's right, and it's quite a big, round, circular light, so it's capturing a fairly big area there, you know, all around the top of the apple. Mind you, I've exaggerated it a little bit as well, because this is the artwork. It's an artwork in itself. Now, you can see it letter B, and letter B is a shadow edge area. And this is really important, this area here. This place where the light disappears from the form, sometimes not completely because it's lit up by um, either the surfaces around it, but it is the shadow edge area and it is the darkest part of the form itself. So this is the darkest part of the apple itself before you go into the shadow. So mm. this is called the shadow edge area. It's the edge of the shadow. Mm. And if you leave this out of your drawing, your drawing will look really flat as well. And when you squint, you see that. It's important to squint when you're um, first assessing where the various lights and shades are going to go in your work because you can see it better when you squint because it blurs all the tones. So this is the shadow edge area. And then if we move to letter D next, we can talk about the letter D. This area here is what we call the half-tone area. The half tone area, the areas on the apple, um, this particular apple, or the areas on any object between the full light area and the shadow edge, 
or between the shadow edge and the reflected light area. So half tones are areas that are not really, really dark, but they're not really, really light, just as it implies a half tone. So let us see. Let's look at let us see. This is the reflected light area at let us see. And reflect. Um, lights up the object but not as much as what the full light does and if we make the mistake of making that reflective light area too bright if we make it as bright as a full light area we can really flatten the object mm -hmm. unless it's a very highly reflective surface like a glass and things like that sometimes mm -hmm. they, they can be as bright careful not to let it compete with the full light area because if you compete, that means making it as bright as it in the form will flatten. And then we look at letter D. Letter D is the cast shadow area. And this is the area that most of us know. You're saying and letter, instinctively e, see letter E. Letter, letter E. Letter E. Letter E. Yeah, that's, that is the cast shadow area. That's the deepest, darkest part of the object. And that's the shadow that you see outside on a bright day um, underneath a tree. You see that shadow, that deep, dark cast shadow. And you can also see the very darkest shadow inside the top of the apple stem as well. So if we scroll up inside there. That's important too because it's very dark in there as well. And you'll see the shadow that goes over the form. That's also a cast shadow, that one there. And notice how it curves to follow the shape of the form. Remember that um, shadows follow the shape of the ground beneath them or the form beneath them. And that shadow there is not as dark as the one beneath the apple because that shadow is in light. So if there's a shadow in light, it's not as dark as a shadow beneath the object. Mm. There, that should explain that Good. quite Good. well, hopefully. So the important thing with this theory, this science of light and shade, is that you try to know, try to learn it, try to understand it really well. And if you don't learn the names, it's really important to understand that there are five major areas of light and shadow, and that if you know those off by heart, you can apply them into your drawings. And once you do that, you can draw from your imagination because you're just adding it in. And also, like I was saying earlier, Mark, um, we can put these into our drawings when they're not in the photographs because a lot of the times this information is not in your photograph. So I always say to people throughout the course, you have a lot of photographs provided for you, but you need to apply the science of light and shade, this theory that you're learning, along with looking at the photograph. So looking at a photograph is never enough because a photo always distorts things, it leaves out valuable information, and it's a real test then to see if you have learnt or if you're learning your theory. Because I can see straight away if you're working from a photograph. So this is exciting. And this is a skill that can be learned. Now you'll find that um, many of the great masters of art used about 20 values or more in a value scale mark. And um, in the course we work with only six. And you can get incredible results with just six tones. And I know that these um, six tones are not necessarily as black as what you can go because when you're working with a ten tone value scale, that means a value scale is where we draw, where we shade in different values of light and dark, gradually going darker and darker. And I say that during this development of the second natural comparison skill, it's important not to get too bogged down with a huge big value range. I just want you to be able to learn where to place these five major areas of light and shade and then after you've applied, after you've learned with a six value scale, then you can expand that knowledge and you can work with a 10 value scale and then go on to a 20 value scale if you need to. Look, Mark's brought up the shoe here. Well done, Mark. That was, yeah, that's just based on we did this, the, the, the six values you're talking about and that's yeah. how we got all the tones in this shoe. Yeah, you can tell everybody, this is your shoe, Mark. That's my you, shoe. It's not actually yeah. my shoe, but it's the shoe I drew, yeah. But I yeah. had shoes that look like this. <laughs> And, and you can see the full light area and out at the edges of the full light area you can see the half tones, especially on the heel there, can't you Mark? Yeah. See the yeah. round of the back part of the heel, you can just see the full light, half tones, shadow edge, 
that's why you did so well with this because you you added into it, didn't you? You applied. I did, and the point and the point is too. I didn't require twenty different value steps to do it; just the six you you narrowed it down to to create this convincing, this you know, hyper real convincing impact. I just wanted to show that. I'm Thanks. okay. Right. Let's go. Back. Play initiative. I love it. <laughs> so should we move on then to the next to the third? Think, yeah, let's do natural comparison skill. Get me. I call these natural abilities because they are abilities. They're not really skills. So we are using a natural ability that we're born with, and we're applying that as a drawing skill to a drawing skill. And, and I'm just so excited to let you know there is only four. This is really really exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to you afterwards about how I came across all this understanding as well, if we have time, Mark. Oh, that'd be interesting, yeah. So the, the um, third skill that we're looking at, and these are in no particular order, by the way, This, um, but I put them into an order to make it easier for everybody. So this third skill is a natural gift of size comparison. Now, let's talk about size comparison. Oh, Mark, this is one of my favourites because I go through this nearly every day of my life with my two daughters. They <laughs> are constantly comparing sizes. <laughs> oh, she's got a bigger piece of cake. Why has she got one more than me? Why is it bigger? Why is it smaller? Oh, my goodness. So, <laughs> size comparison. That's so funny. Size comparison is something that we deal with on a daily basis. Look, when you cut the veggies up for dinner, for example, if, if we get the mashed potato in wrong sizes compared to one another, you've got crunchy hard bits, haven't you, and soft bits. <laughs> you've got to try to get it sort of right, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And even baking potatoes, you want them cut similar. And most of us aren't too bad at that. What do you think, Mark? What do yeah. you like at cutting your potatoes? <laughs> I like them cut up small. <laughs> Do you cut Manage potatoes? Whole size, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is that we are all born with this natural ability to halve things, and we know when something is bigger than something else. A little child will even tell you that their size, their piece of chocolate cake is not as big as their little siblings or as their friends. So we do know how to halve. I'm not saying that we're all instantly good at it because we can have several attempts to get our halving right, but it is something that we're born with, the ability to halve, the ability to compare sizes. Now, this skill in drawing needs to be practiced, and we can practice it, but you don't just have to rely on being good at the ability to halve an area or the ability to compare sizes. I have good news for everyone, Mark. <laughs> we, can use, we can use some great tools, methods and techniques that have been handed down to us from the great masters of art. So even though we have the ability, the natural ability to compare sizes, we're often very good at detecting when it's wrong. But what do we do about getting it right in our drawings? Well, we don't have to leave it to chance. We can use perspective, which is an area that I absolutely adore. Huh. You know, Mark, some people make perspective so difficult. And it doesn't have to be. I use coloured lines to teach um, perspective to make it fun and exciting. And guess what, Mark? We learned free hand perspective after we've done it technically. Oh, that's cool. Can you yeah. imagine? That makes it so exciting. So there are things that we could use. There's the other technique called sighting that I was showing you earlier when I was holding my pencil up. Right. And the sighting method can be used when you, you know, when you outstretch your arm to measure and compare sizes to things. So the ability to compare sizes is a very valuable skill in art, and that's what we need to develop. And you do get better at that skill the more you learn it. You do definitely get better at it, but you can use tools, methods, and techniques that are taught through the course that will help you. And don't ever think that if you're using a tool, method or technique that you are cheating, because that's absolute rubbish. You just use whatever tool or technique you need to get your top result. You know, Mark, let's talk about that for a second because even tracing a drawing, right? People think that tracing the outline of a drawing is cheating or using a projector is cheating. That is not true because even the, even the most experienced, if you haven't learnt your drawing skills, you can get tracing wrong. Most artists that trace, we are thinking every minute about what we're actually drawing and we even change the drawing while we're going over it to trace it. Mm -hmm. So if anyone says to me, 
oh, I shouldn't use a projector for my outline or whatever. All that is doing is speeding up the outline drawing process. We know jolly well that we could do the same drawing using um, our comparison of angle skills, our grid method or whatever else you learn, especially during unit one of the course. There's many methods to get your outline drawing. So perspective is another really valuable tool that we use and you learn that during unit four cool. of the course. Cool. You know so you the, the tracing. You know the tracing point, Cindy. I just I, it occurs to me that Brunelleschi and those early practitioners of perspective, when they first discovered it in the Renaissance, they were tracing over glass pieces of glass, and so yeah. they were incorporating tracing with their, with their just like you say, with their free hand and their, um, and their perspective yeah. tools. So yeah, and you know what, Mark? I have seen students just randomly trace a building, even this building, that that trace it and they still get that lines wrong because right. they do not understand the theory of perspective. And lines, when you're tracing them, they can easily be accidentally just a tiny bit wrong when you when you are yeah. tracing perspective lines. Yeah. So you need to understand the um, theory of perspective. And for example, let's look at this picture, this perspective picture here. See all those pink lines on the left there? They will all eventually converge to one common point way over on the left. And do you know what? When we did these courses in the live classroom, we had string that was about four or five meters long yeah. to find. I think it's freezing a bit there. I'll say it yeah. again. Yeah. So, um, what I was saying was that these perspective lines on the left are very important, and their convergence lines, they will all go off. To a left vanishing point, way over, and do you know what? When we when we were learning this in the live classroom, we had pieces of string that were about five meters long that extended way, way, way over. So, just but when you are drawing it, you just keep in your mind that all of those angles need to gradually decrease because you know that at one point, far, far away, they're going to be meeting off to the left. Same as on the right you know that eventually they're going to be meeting at one common point. So just with that simple theory in your mind, then you can trace even better. You can trace with knowledge. See the difference? Yes. Isn't that exciting? Big difference. <laughs> you yeah. can't, you it, don't it, have it to really rely. Is. You don't have to rely just on your ability to compare angles. You combine it with um, methods and um, techniques that are handed down to us from the great masters. So when we talk about size comparison, that's one method that we can use to get sizes correct. Another size comparison tool that we can use in art, that's the finished drawing there that I created and that's also an exercise in the course that we learn in unit four. The shading is extra. Everybody can shade it if they want to as a, an extra bonus and there's actually a tutorial on how to shade it as well. But really wow. all, all, all that's expected is to do the outline drawing. But like everything in the course, I teach you in teeny weeny baby steps and they're so much fun. You learn everything really easily along the way. And you know, in saying this Mark, can I just add how important it is to have an instructor to oversee your work? You know, yeah, how, how, t tell us about that Cindy. It's really good to study the course on your own as a self-teach model because I've designed it so that I'm basically talking to you in the notes. My only concern, and, and I really do love it when people just buy the notes because I think, well, at least you have got all that knowledge and theory. But my main concern is that you fully understand what is written and that you have, you know, put your pencil on the right angle, that you have achieved those brush, those pencil strokes and everything. The idea of having me or one of the instructors as instructor supported is so that we can check every single exercise in the course. This is another unique thing about our course. I don't know where else on the internet offers that option to check every single exercise. Now, Mark, the reason why this is so important is because if you get to the end of that unit of the course and you haven't perfected those little skills along the way, the end result is going to be a non-perfect result or not as good as what it could be. So the idea is that you do the one little exercise, then you email it to me. I will check it for you. And I check using a three-step process and so do my instructors who I've personally trained. It took me two years to train those ladies.
Mm -hmm. And um, we all use a system. They've been trained with a system that I designed and it's methodical and it's, and it's structural and it's so exciting, Mark, because it almost guarantees that people are going to get results if they enrol to study with us personally. And as you know at the moment, I'm actually teaching myself and there's a good reason for this. I am um, putting myself back into the course and teaching for a while. I'm only going to do it probably for this year or at least part of this year, so that I can go back and reassess and see where we need improvements, where we need oh. development. Um, and because I just feel the timing's right to go back in and teach. I do have a cut-off point, though, because there is only a certain number of students that we can teach because everybody is given one-to-one -one tuition. So when I get your work, I will be looking at that piece, only that piece of work, and I'll assess it. And I can tell you with this three-step process, I'll be telling you, first of all, where you've gone right with your drawing. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to encourage you and say, this is great, you've done this area right, I'm really pleased, you've done really well. And then I'm going to point out to you anywhere that you could have done differently. I'm not going to say it's wrong, but I'll say what you needed to do differently here is this. So the third thing is, I'll be telling you how you can fix it. So this is really important. First of all, I'll compliment you and tell you exactly where you've gone right with your work and then I'll tell you where you needed to do it differently and finally, how. So what we're doing here is we're doing what Daniel Coyle says in his book, The Talent Code. We are perfecting the little baby steps. We are entering into perfect practice and I want to ensure that you are practicing perfectly so that by the time you get to the end skill of creating the project, which is the end of each unit, because there's seven weeks in each little unit of the course and at the end of each unit you're given a project and the idea of the project is to pull together everything that you've learned. Now, if you've done all of your exercises leading up that point and made all of the changes that we've suggested on your work, then by the time you get that project it's going to be much easier for you, it's going to be more enjoyable and you've got more of a chance of getting the results that you're after because you've been entering into perfect practice. Now I take quite a bit of responsibility and so do my ladies, my instructors. We take quite a bit of responsibility and caring to make sure that you're understanding it. We don't actually guarantee that you will learn to draw well, but I can say that there's probably only been, I can count on my fingers out of thousands of people that we've taught that haven't been able to get the results that other students achieve. Yeah. Um, and often, often Mark, it's just simply because there are some people that um, struggle to understand the written note or, you know, there is an occasion that people can't understand and we're, so we can't guarantee it. But all I can say is that you can learn this, um, you can learn these skills and techniques just like you learnt to read or write. And if you remember when you were learning to write how much you had to perfect those letters, well, we're going to go through that as you learn to draw. And so you get the equivalent of all these files back, your homework with Cindy's written personal notes, which it just kind of exponentially uh, uh, enforces the the content material that's in the that's in the that's in your lessons. So you'll have all of these. You'll have them in a file. You can go back over them. You can. Uh, my thought is it keeps you from making the same mistakes over and over again, which you practicing better. So. You know, and it's so true, Mark, because you want to correct it before you practice. You need to correct it before you practice. There are times, though, that people get it right the first time. There's quite a lot of times that they do. And I won't lie to you and say to you it's right or it's good if it's not, because it's my responsibility to help you to adjust it. But I'm not saying that everybody gets it to the same level as everybody else, but most people are very similar and very close. You can tell that by the before and after pictures that you'll see in a minute again coming up. But right. let's go on. Let, let's move on to the next skill okay. show. Let's go over to um, this is the final skill. This is the fourth skill, the fourth and final one. Really exciting one. I love this one. This is your ability to compare spaces. And I love this. And this is the fourth main skill. Notice how these are all comparison skills that I'm talking about. It is our natural ability to compare. So with the fourth and final skill, it is our ability to be able to arrange objects. So when we're arranging objects, we are just thinking very carefully about where things are in space. We're thinking, does this feel good? Do I feel cluttered? Does it, does it feel right to me? And we know that we all like to shuffle things around and put them in order so that we can access them or so they just feel right. Now, when we talk about this ability to arrange objects as a drawing skill, 
um, we're talking about where we place objects in our drawing. Now this is a very exciting skill. This is one that takes the longest to learn. Hmm. In order to get to this final skill, it is really important to be able to do the outline drawing part, to be able to do your shading and all of that for the individual objects and then we put them together as a whole object, uh, as a whole um, skill when we arrange the objects. So with this skill, what we're doing is we're looking at um, what we call in art the, the understanding and the study of composition. So uh, this is the one that I really love so much. We can learn how to place objects in the right places in our picture. And it's all based on um, balance, so where we're, where we're placing the objects to balance them in the picture plane. It's based on um, leading the viewer eye into the picture and around the picture and captivating their interest and their excitement and their attention. But there are all kinds of things that come into this pulling of the picture together. And Mark, you know why I'm so excited to speak to your audience about this? Because I know that we've got hundreds of illustrators out there and there are a lot of people that when they're submitting their drawings into your weekly critiques, often it is the composition skills that are lacking. That's that's true. We do find that composition is, is the un, unthought about, uh, unattended to uh, element so often. Yeah, and do you know, and, and you know, and of course, of course I'm not teaching you because you already know this stuff, but we're just communicating in this way today. But well, no, you, know, you have taught me, Cindy. <laughs> taught me oh, a lot. <laughs> you know it all. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing I love about composition is that, now this is where your original art comes into it. This is where you begin to design completely original art from your imagination. Okay, so let's say you have learnt how to um, draw an individual object, let's say a couple of little bunnies and a little dog and a horse or whatever and people riding a horse, you're going to draw these individual things. But then you're thinking, oh my gosh, how do I put all this together on a page? So this is where the area of composition comes into it. Now, the way that I've designed Unit 6 of the course is so that you have certain structures to be able to um, apply in your drawings. Let's look at some of these. This is really exciting. Okay. For example, for example, when you um, first begin to put together your picture, yeah, you can see the PDF file. Now, when you're ready, Mark, you can pull that up. There, have a look at that picture. Now, that, that was a, a drawing that I did, Mark, for the Jungle Book. I felt inspired to enter into a competition for designing... Wow. Um, the Jungle Book, which I wasn't successful in, in winning, but I really loved the process. It was fantastic. So our goal was to choose a picture from the Jungle Book and to put it into our stylization. And I still have a dream of one day illustrating the entire Jungle Book. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one day. So <sighs> that's my Mowgli there, and he's a grown-up Mowgli because he's a teenager then. And and then you can see Bargera and you can see bats and all kinds of things in the picture. But the whole idea is that from the bottom of the page, those little plants there, they're called the Bird of Paradise flowers, mm -hmm. they lead us, they point us in to Mowgli and you'll see a little pathway there at the bottom of the page leading us in. So we do Mowgli who is, he's in the focal point area. Now we have four major focal point areas in our image and you can find an area for your focal point by dividing your composition into three equal sections, horizontally and vertically, and then you end up with four little places um, that, uh, that collide. So there's four little places around the um, composition that we call our focal point areas. Basically, it's just a bit off, off the centre. It's never right in the centre. I won't say never because we all break the rules and if we break them, so we're on Mowgli. So the idea is that um, with this composition structure, this is actually called a foreground frame composition structure. Um, and the reason why it's a foreground frame composition structure is because there are elements in the foreground touching all four sides mm. of the artwork. So, um, for example, you can see the plants in the foreground at the bottom and then the palm tree there that's also in the foreground and the vines at the top there 
all of those elements are touching all four sides. So it gives us this feeling of peering through. <coughs> and so we go up, we're led to man out the point area and then you sort of look up at the little owl and then your eye races along to the vine that he's hanging on and then off to the bat that's flying over towards, um, it's Bargira, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You can see the, um, the, the bright um, star as well that just sort of grabs your eye and then the moon in the background and all these elements bring your um, bring your eye across to the right, the left side and then that big vine just pulls you down back into the plants and then you go back again for another treat and it's this kind of flow that you go through the artwork. So you're led into the bottom of the page, you go up the focal point, you go up to all the elements and you get drawn across to the left side then to some other interesting elements and then back down again. It's this constant flow. Now what I'm explaining here Mark is that we have this composition structure. Now this is just one particular structure that we can compose with and it's called the foreground frame. There are other compositional structures that I teach in the course. There's actually loads of them um, but I only teach uh, several, just a handful, just to get you started. Sure. The, impo the important thing is being aware of these compositional things that help you to design the space. And I know that with um, children's picture book illustration, there are several types of imagery and designs that we construct. For example, we use vignettes. Do you call them vignettes, Mark? Mm -hmm. where, where, where they don't that. come to the edge of the page? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So you might have a vignette, but even within that, you have a certain structure that you'll be using, and they'll always be the focal point and, and at the way that you pull the viewer around the page. The whole idea of this fourth skill of being able to compare space is that we can actually put it into a formal structure with art. You can put it into this formal um, logical sequential process and procedure. But one thing that I need to express too that is so important, there's lots of one things that I say, <laughs> another thing I should say, that you learn all these processes very logically and sequentially, but then we let them go. And that's when I call it magic. And that's what I felt when I was drawing the apple in the last tutorial. I felt the magic because I barely even looked at my reference photo, as you saw, Mark, and I was yeah. just making art and just adding that and building up that shadow area, that, that shadow edge, and just allowing that light and shade to just grow and develop in the drawing. Yeah, good point. You were creating. But let's just you think were, for a moment. Cindy, you were creating your own apple, in effect. Yeah. had the most incredible reference in front of you and you really didn't. You just knew the, the principles you're talking about here. <laughs> Delay. We'll wait for Cindy to catch up. She's a long way away. Hear me? Yep. Hello? We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you, Cindy. You're good. So I was just double checking. You yeah. froze on me. Okay. Oh, we both froze on each other. Okay. That's all right. Um, anyway, I was going to say it's really important to know that we learn all these rules and everything, but then we tend to let them go Yeah. after we've learned them, and they all become subconscious and not quite so scientific and so um, logical and sequential. But right. like anything in life, you have to do your piano scales before you can play beautiful music. And that's what my course is. It's basically all those fundamental principles that form a solid foundation and then you can launch out from there. And they'll provide you with everything you need to know to go to a live art class. I always say, Mark, that it's a course that you need to do before you go to an art course. Talking about colour now, because some of you may be asking, where does colour come into all of this? Yeah. Now, colour, colour is a separate thing again, and we need to treat it as a completely separate study, I believe, anyway. Mm -hmm. Because my whole method is based on separating these major skills so that you learn them all really well individually before bringing them together as a whole. Oh. You're refining these comparison skills so that when you bring them together, they're more um, deeply understood and practiced. So then we add colour pencil into it. And I do put colour pencil in there at Unit 5, 
and Unit 6 so that you have that foundation knowledge prior to entering into Colour Pencil. So Colour Pencil, um, it's, it's actually so wonderful because all of a sudden you've been working with all this grey and then all of a sudden you're working with colour and it's really dynamic. It, it is a process though to try to get your mind to understand that with colour pencil you don't just press harder to go darker. That's a big thing that a lot of people sort of can't understand at first. It's pressing harder and so it's not going darker. You've got to use colour. You've got to use hue to send the viewer's eye back, cool hues to send the viewer back, deeper, darker hues of the same colour. For example, like your deep magentas and mahogany sort of colours when you're doing a red apple. That's why I used those colours last week. They're in the same value family. And I also put some deep, cool purple in there too to send it back. So cool colours can recede and send the viewer's eye back and warm colours bring them forward, bring elements forward on the picture plane in general. So these are just little tips and things that you can use with colour. So um, it's not one of the comparison skills, it's just something that you learn and in the course I have a, a, a very deep explanation about colour theory, about how you can use the colour wheel and I use a Sir Isaac Newton colour wheel mark, I know that you use a different colour wheel but it's great to be aware of both of those um, colour yep. wheels and to be able to use them when you need to. So. We were talking briefly about the before and after drawings in the beginning when I first showed the front page, but I think it's just so worth having a lovely look at these pictures. On the left hand side you'll see the before picture and notice that people come to me at any level of ability in the course, all different levels of ability. These on the left here are actually quite good, that's a high, high standard that they've come to me, but these people that come at that level have always said to me, Cindy, I just can't get any further on my own. I just don't know how to progress. So yeah. they go right back to the first unit of the course and I put them through the entire course. The image on the right is the image that they've created just 64, around about 64 hours of the course. Now, when I say 64 hours, they've been studying from between two to four hours a week and this is at the end of the third unit of the course. Studying for two, <laughs> two to four hours a week and that's about the end of the, the um, third unit of the course. So we can just go through these slowly, just enjoying them, just noticing the progress. And these are all very typical. The, um, and the next drawing that comes up, yeah, we can have a good look at that. I love the zooming in. They're just beautiful, aren't they? The progress is just phenomenal. Yeah, phenomenal. And I get really excited about this, Mark, because these people are taught over the internet. I've never seen them in a real class, never met them in real person. <laughs> yeah. Internet is a marvelous teaching tool that people are just now discovering. Should we go on to the next one? Particularly when you combine it with the feedback from the instructor, individual feedback like you're providing. Yeah, and this one's really important, Mark, because I want people to see the picture on the left there, um, this, this is great because this is a very typical drawing that we see on the left. Uh -huh. Most people come drawing at about the 10 to 12 year old child level and this right. is perfectly normal because most people come out of school not being able to draw. We need to understand that. I've had yeah. so many people really beating themselves up that they don't know how to draw but it is perfectly normal to not be able to draw. It's just amazing because if you haven't been taught how to draw, just like you were taught how to read and write, you can't expect yourself to draw. Even though you were born with all these, these four major comparison skills, you were never taught how to put them together. That's the secret that I forgot to, to actually tell you as well. The secret is that we learn how to put them all together in a unique way. And I really love that because people can learn to draw mark just to... Um, just to be able to draw, not necessarily to become an artist. So you don't have to learn how to draw because you want to be an artist. You can learn how to draw just to have a deeper understanding of who you are, your own identity. It really helps to, um, to help you with self-identity. It's incredible how that can happen during Unit 6 of the course as you reflect. And during Unit 6 I teach people how to take just a simple idea just from a thought into a completed artwork. 
This example again, these are all adults learning to draw for the first time. Had they had art training before sending the results? Some have. Mm -hmm. In those before pictures that you see, they've been off to art school. Some of them have even been to, to university and studied drawing at university mm -hmm. and they haven't learned to draw. Right. And many of them have been to all different um, classes and courses because the whole idea with your before portrait is that you do it completely unaided. You don't do it in a um, class with a teacher or anything like that. You just do it yourself looking in a mirror. Yeah. So if you scroll down, I think. Oh, there's yeah. your units. Well, you, want to, course, you want to go into the units of the course? Yeah. You know, what, what strikes me about the images, the portraits, Cindy, is not only do they capture a physical likeness or seem to, since we don't know the person, but they seem to capture the very, some very essence, some psychological truth about mm -hmm. the, the people as well. So in the physical observation comes uh, a deeper kind of observation if you're looking, I guess, closely and carefully enough. These these look like real people that we can all relate to on the right. I'm just so amazed that you've said that, Mark, because you're, you always seem to have these incredible comments that I really love because they just, they just touch on something that's so important to tell everybody. And that statement that you just made is it's very profound because this is what happens to people. Everybody who enters into this process of creating their own self-portrait in my course describe, well not everybody, but most people that have talked to me about the process say that they describe this amazing cathartic process, this process of understanding who they deeply are and it's facing up to a reality and a truth of who you are. You've got to look at yourself in the mirror, you've got to look at your own photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people find it hard. They find it really hard to do it first, but once they actually dive into it, and I say just imagine that you're diving into a deep blue ocean and you're going to be free once you just dive in and start swimming and just feeling it because it really does free people once they've done it. Yeah, yeah, and you feel the, and in that self-discovery, you feel the, the nobility of each one of these people. You, you love them because they... That somehow their their truth is coming across, and they these are noble portraits. These these are very uh, yeah. I don't want to say fair. flattering, but they're they're very uh, uh, winning and they're truthful honest, portraits. Uh, honest and and very very uh, th thrilling and liberating. Yeah. Yeah, and so it's not just a matter of creating a portrait, and this is you know the course is designed to heal your life as well. You know, when I say designed, when I set out on this journey to create the course itself, I never really imagined the massive impact it would have on people. All I knew is that drawing had changed my life and I wanted other people to experience the joy, the wonder and the freedom and liberation that I experienced by being able to say to myself, hey, oh my gosh, I can draw this. I can draw myself. I can draw pictures of my children. I can draw um, an eye, an apple, a car. I can draw whatever I really set my heart to drawing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I need to use reference materials most times, especially drawing it for the first time. And until you've really drawn something, you don't really know what's there. And that's why when you redraw yourself, you really see what's there. And, Mark, this is so lovely, when you do a self-portrait, you suddenly realize that there is really no ugly out there. Right, we are right. all beautiful. We're right. all beautiful because we're all just a little bit different. And the difference is so tiny. It's yeah. ridiculous. It's almost by the width of your charcoal. Yeah. So you yeah. learn so much. Yeah, you and you've got to be able to capture that with your observing and using the four skills. And that's what that's what an artist does in the in the best case scenario. Or let's go back to the PDF. I think you're about to cover the. Uh, yeah. The the. I get carried away when I talk about portraiture because it's such a profound oh, it's, subject. Oh, it's thrilling. Oh, those portraits are thrilling to see the, <laughs> the the nobility that comes out. All right, so here we go. Unit one. Okay. The whole course is designed in six separate major units. And the reason why it's broken down into these major units of study is so that we can concentrate on just one area of study at a time. Hmm. So in the first unit of study, you're learning outline drawing. 
So outline drawing, we need to think about what that really is. Outline drawing is also in, not only the outline edges of the objects, but also all of the elements in between. Now I'm using outline drawing as a vehicle. It is a means to the end and not the end in itself. So we use outline drawing just simply to learn and ref to refine your comparison of angle skill. So we're learning to draw in outline much more accurately. Now during outline drawing you'll be presented with a whole heap of different exercises and it will probably take us an extra hour if we went through each week of the course individually. I'll you scroll. can come along and collect the actual booklet afterwards. I think Mark, haven't we got a link? We do have the link. It's, it's, uh, it's in the comments section and also to, in the details box to the right of the broadcast screen. The first link you see is a link that will take you to a sign up page and, you, and if by signing up you'll, you'll re receive the occasional newsletters of Cindy's website uh, and 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 when lots of freebies. They give out lots of freebies. Lots of instruction and freebies. A wonderful. It, it, they won't uh, bludgeon you with with yeah. mailings, but it'll be it'll be really valuable to you. And then and then right away you'll get an email from uh, Cindy's husband Stuart or from Cindy. I'm not sure who saying Stuart welcome to the writing. welcome to the newsletter. And then you'll have the link to this download and uh, right there for you to download this whole PDF. And we're going to be making it. We're going to be making all the links that and tutorials that Cindy has put together for us, uh, the ones that she's given away, the uh, Apple PDF, for example, and some of the ones she did for us last year. I'll talk to Cindy about making some of those available. We'll have those available in, in the replays of these videos. Excuse me, Cindy, I went on a bit. but um, No, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. And I think it's really important, too, to, for everybody to understand that at the moment I'm personally teaching, and this is really special to me, I'm really looking for a handful of people who want to study with me personally, and if, if you've got that calling, if you've got that thought that you really would love to study with me, please get in contact with us and let us know, and, and or just, just sign, just go through the button and, and buy the course, and then you'll get me personally studying with you, and I really want to encourage you to do now, that. That, that, link, that link is the second link you'll find in the, PD, in the details box. It's also, if there's a little box inside the details box that says official website, well, that, that's your order link for the course, and it will also tell you the specials that we're offering for this promotion that Cindy's talking about, and did you want to cover those now, or did you want to go through the the? Yeah, you might want to. Um, it might be good to see you, well, Mark, and I can just talk about the course if you like, rather than reading it on the screen. Let's so do that. that. Let me let me do that. Hang on. Lose my way. Put you up. Uh, You're doing a fantastic job, Mark. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm stopping screen sharing. Stop. Is there any questions at all? We haven't even asked. We haven't, we haven't, I haven't seen questions yet. So uh, oh. if you guys have some questions, this would be a good time. We're, we're kind of at the wrapping up stage here, so don't be alarmed. We won't, we won't talk all morning. Hang on, Cindy. I'm trying. I've lost my tabs here. I'm getting. It's okay. I'll have a little drink of water while you look for them. Okay. Oh yeah, there are some comments coming in, and but I was just going to talk about the specials for a second while you're taking the gulp of water, Cindy. These are <laughs> these specials are. Hang on. These specials are are really unique. The first one is $205 off the normal price of the course if you use the little the little uh, voucher code that uh, that Cindy and Stuart have provided us with. And uh, so we're not sure how long we're going to keep this up. It's going to be for a very limited time. Cindy can only take so many students, right? We only have so much bandwidth, or she only has so much bandwidth. She's she's teaching the course. Uh, by herself this time to get feedback and to sort of uh, see where she wants to tweak and continue to develop the course. So there's there's not that room, much room. It, there's it's limited seating, so uh, so we will keep the special up. We want to get the seats filled as quickly as possible so she can get started and start interacting with your homework. Uh, so so after in a, in a very short time we're going to be taking the specials down because her class will be filled. So the the first is the discount that you see there, terrific discount. The other big special I'm going to call it a special is that Cindy herself is teaching the course. She'll be answering your homework, providing you with her feedback, her notes, her constructive criticism. I've been through her her, her training, uh, not all of it, but what I did go through was um, was 
pretty life changing and uh, profound. And uh, the the personal feedback from Cindy in that course because she taught that one by her you know herself as well uh, made made the huge difference for me. Uh, I needed some correction, you know, some course changing, and it was a really it was so useful. And she does it in such a kind, nice way. We all benefited from her. Um, her personal instruction and her insight. And she was hinting at earlier. She can look at a piece that you've done, and in, in two seconds, she knows exactly where you strayed from these core ideas she's talking about that will make all the difference for you. So uh, Cindy's personally teaching it. Also, if you if you sign up for the course during this limited time, I'm going to be giving a complimentary. Uh, tuition to my children's book illustration course. It's a uh, the Make Your Marks and Splashes course. It's uh, years in the making. Cindy's instruction I think is so valuable that I want you to have it. So I, so to, as an inducement, if you haven't ordered the Make Your Marks and Splashes course, I'm I'm adding that to the pot to sweeten the deal as well. You'll get uh, full tuition to the full course, and there are tons of tons of video interviews with my author illustrator buddies and. Uh, uh, core lesson critiques that we do every month twice a month so that comes with this this order when you um, when you sign up with this link in this special promotion that we're just going to keep up for just a very short time I will be done with it by the end of April I'm I'm sure probably sooner than that quite a bit sooner C Cindy is going to get to the tipping point where she can't take any more students how many emails can you write in a day right so um, I wanted to say that, and uh, so the specials are over on that link that's in the official website box in the big in the big box. And okay, so now we've we've pitched the the course, Cindy. Let's go back to where you were um, talking about the module. Yeah, I'll just whiz through. Yeah, so the whole course is based on six separate units, so that we can concentrate on one of the major comparison skills at a time, and. They begin to come together. So, in other words, Unit 1, we're refining the outline drawing. We're refining the comparison of angle skill during learning your outline. There's loads of methods and skills that you're going to be learning that professional artists use. They're very important skills and methods that will help you draw better, faster, quicker, and more professionally. Mm -hmm. In Unit 2, you'll be learning how to shade and how to add the shading to your drawing. And then in Unit 3, now, so Unit 2 is very important because that's where your drawings come to life. They're no longer flat. They become formed. It's very exciting to move into Unit 2, yeah. shading and form. And again, there's a load of skills and professional techniques that help you to, to complete your work more quickly and more professionally and making sure that you get it right every time. And then in Unit 3, we move into portraiture, and I choose portraiture for a very good reason. It pulls together all the three units so it pulls together unit one and two and combined with unit three, which is proport, uh, proportion. And you can learn a lot about proportion even in unit three, which is um, portraiture. But then we do go into much greater detail during unit four in pers perspective and proportion. I'm getting my P's all tangled up there. <laughs> <laughs> so unit four takes us even deeper into perspective and proportion and I teach it in such a fun way. Don't try to avoid perspective, please everybody. It's so important in all your background illustration and that when you're creating children's picture book illustration, you need that perspective more than anything. So the prior units are really important but boy, unit four is so important as well. And then finally going to unit five which is Colour, glorious colour. You learn all the theory of different colour um, combinations and um, mood, or learn all about mood with colour. And it's colour pencil. It's a wonderful course. It's co-authored by Tennis Tridell. I invited Tennis to call uh, to author that with me. So the whole idea is that Unit Six brings together everything that you've learnt so far in the course, and then it also um, teaches you all picture together and we begin by just talking about how to get your thoughts and ideas out from the subconscious into the conscious using structure, using processes so that you're not just left with artist's block time and time again. It's an incredible course. It'll take you from being an absolute beginner, not being able to draw at all, right through to being professional.
Yeah. And then you can take all that knowledge that you've learned. You'll be able to refer back to your course books for week, for years and years to come. Very comprehensive course notes, and it's all um, presented as course notes, PDF notes. So you can print them out. You can take them away from your computer, relax in your studio, go to the park, go to a coffee shop, read your notes, and just think over them analyze them and then get started on your exercises. It's a very simple process. Great. Once you've drawn your exercises in the course, you just scan them in or take a photo of them and email them to me. I will put together a little PDF um, and when it's some big changes I do the PDF but if they're just little changes I'll just write it in your email for you because sometimes it's only little changes that are needed and then there's bigger changes and then I do full PDF files for those bigger changes. You okay. can be reassured of one thing though, you will not escape me <laughs> if your work needs improvement. C Cindy is, is a tough teacher, she's, she's very kind and lots of fun but she's firm and um, she reminds me of uh, if, you know, I, Cindy I hope this doesn't sound too disparaging but if Mary Poppins was teaching an art course and, and creating professional grade artists that's who that's who you remind me of so uh, did you just I hope you heard that Cindy <laughs> again I don't know what it's doing the the hangout technology is, is, is getting tired so we're gonna we'll, we'll wrap up but um, there are some questions Cindy replay. questions yeah we got some questions and let me hurl them at you um, uh, Ruth had a real good question. Uh, she says, I would love, love, love to purchase the course, but it is difficult to pay the entire amount at one time, even with the discount offered through the presentation. Would we still be able to get the discount and make monthly payments, or is the discount only valid if we make a full one-time payment? Like Cindy pointed out, although I've received college and art school training, even at higher levels, I've not been able to draw as well as I would like to and have hit the wall where I don't know how to go from here. I'm passionate about art and desperately want to improve and develop my skills to the best of my abilities. Well, we can all relate, Ruth, we hear you. Cindy, what do, what, what do you say to a payment plan of some kind? Definitely, Ruth. Um, we'll work out uh, a payment option. I don't know why we haven't done that yet, but we will work out a payment option so that you can have the reduced rate on the payment and anybody that wants that please just email Stuart admin at drawpj.com I'll write it in and make sure that you tell us that you heard about yeah. yes. So, yeah so if they just email us and make sure they mention that they've um, heard it from Marks and Splashes because we definitely won't be giving it to other people that have not okay thanks and Madeline says I can vouch for the fact that Cindy sees things we don't it was a tiny change that made a huge difference. Yeah, I, I feel that way about her teaching as well. If there are no more questions, guys, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Thank you for staying with us this morning. The replay will be up. I'll send the link out. Cindy, can you give me a Stuart's email one more time? Admin at drawpj.com. Okay. If you have questions that you think of, you know, over lunch, and, or when you wake up tomorrow morning, if you want to type them into the comments on this Google Events page, that will be fine too. Cindy will look at them. She's she's very responsive and responsible, and she will she will get back with you. We'll, and, and she'll make sure she does, and she'll make sure I get back with you if I need to on something. So um, she she yeah, takes responsibility not, for Stuart all. Stuart will of be double checking up on us. And as Stuart well. will also be double checking. So uh, guys, we're gonna we'll stop the broadcast now. Thank you once again for attending and sticking with us. Uh, I hope you've gotten something out of the, the tutorials we've had and uh, we hope to see you again on the next adventure. Cindy, do you want to say good evening to everybody? Yes, thank you everybody. Okay, great. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, we'll talk to you all again soon. There's Cindy one more time and we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.